All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Hello, how y'all doing tonight? Feeling good? Cool. Thank you all for again joining us this evening for a lovely conversation and in recognition of our 2021 astronaut scholar, Grace Robertson. I will ask that everyone please silence your cell phones Put away your laptops. Again, you can give an hour of your attention to this wonderful space and time um, and all those good things. And again, uh, thank you for welcome. My name is uh, Dr. Wes Lewis. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Research. So if you wanna get involved with research, come talk to me. Uh, and again, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, first off, I'd like to say a few words. Uh, I'd like to say a special thanks to uh, Nicole Stott and her astronaut colleagues and Mr. Preston Root who has strenuously supported the ASF Foundation, which is, allows us to have the astronaut scholarship here at Embry-Riddle. This is where you guys applause. <laughs> All right. So uh, Nicole Stott is an astronaut, aquanaut artist, mother, and now an author of her first book, Back to Earth, What Life in Space Taught Me About Her Home Planet, Our Mission to Protect It, she currently combines the awe and wonder of spaceflight experience with her artwork to inspire everyone's appreciation of our role as crewmates on Spaceship Earth. After 20, 28 years with NASA, Nicole retired in 2015, and since then has continued to leverage her love for STEM to improve life here on Earth. On her post, oh, sorry, on her post, is that me? <laughs> On her post-NASA mission, uh, she co-founded Space of the Art Foundation, where they were uniting a planetary community of children through the awe and wonder of space exploration and healing power of art. The Space Art Foundation is home to a large-scale space-themed art therapy project like the Space Suit Art Project. Art Space Suit, which some have flown in space, they are created by artwork collected by children in hospitals, refugee camps, orphanages, schools, and every country on the planet. Quilted together by our spacesuit company, ILC Dover, all the projects, okay, all the projects showcase an intersection between personal and planetary health. A native of Albany, New York, uh, raised in Clearwater, Florida, and now has now over 20 years in Houston, Nicole is happy to be back in Florida with her family. After graduating from Clearwater High School, she entered St. Peter's College to study aviation administration, where she earned her private pilot's license. Then later, she came, became an Eagle. Uh, she earned her BS in aeronautical engineering from Emory Riddle, and then she also earned her MS degree in engineering management from the University of Central Florida. Her career began as a job as a structural engineer for Pratt and Whitney Company engines. In 1988, Nicole joined NASA's K Kennedy Space Center, where she worked as an operations engineer in the orbital, orbital processing facility and held other positions within NASA shuttle and space station management. 10 years later, she joined the Johnson Space Center, where she served as the flight simulation engineer on the shuttle training aircraft, flying center seat on the specially modified aircraft that used to train astronauts to safely land in the space shuttle. In 2000, she was selected as a member of the 18th group of the NASA astronauts, in 2006, in preparation for their long duration space flight, uh, Nicole lived and worked in the longest duration NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, NEMO, uh, for 18 days as an Aquarius uh, undersea research habitat. As an experience she believes is the best along to flying in space, she also trains extensively with her ISS crew members in Russia, Japan, Canada, and Europe. In 09 was her first space flight where she was a member of the STS-128 Discovery crew and she flew for three months aboard the ISS as a member of Expedition 20 and 21 crews. Personal highlights during her time on the ISS included performing a spacewalk, first to fly a robotic arm to capture a free Japanese flying cargo vehicle, HTV, working with her international crew in support of a multidisciplinary science on board and orbiting laboratory, painting a watercolor now on a display on the Smithsonian Space Museum, and also a course in life-changing view of her home planet. After three months, she returned to Earth as a member of STS-2019 and Atlantis crew, and was the last ISS crew member to return to space on a shuttle. Uh, from 20, in 21, she went back into space uh, for, with ISS with STS-133 Discovery mission as the final flight of Space Shuttle Discovery. STS-133 was a milestone flight for Embry-Riddle, the first time two alum were on the same flight. Al Drew and Nicole Stott were mission specialists together on this flight. From 2012 to 2018, Nicole served as a member of the Board of University of Trustees. Uh, she is honored as, by the Nicole Stott Art Gallery and the Student Union. How many have been to Starbucks? 
So it's that nice artistic space right past. Uh, you should take a visit. It's a wonderful, wonderful space. And again, uh, along with several of our astronaut colleagues who are also alum, are happy to support the ERAU SAF Astronaut Scholarship Program. And lastly, in space, Scott Stott has experience with her friend and author Frank White describes as an overview effect, a change in the perspective of Earth as a home planet, and for interconnectivity and significance, which reinforced her belief in our role to protect it and all we share as in our home. It's amazing and simple lesson that can come from something as complex as flying in space. We live on a planet, we are all Earthlings. On, and the only bo broader that ma Order that matters is this thin blue atmosphere that blankets and protects us from outer space. By accepting our role as crewmates, not passengers, we have the power to create a future for life on this planet. It's beautiful and it looks amazing from space. Again, without further ado, and thank you for listening to me, is uh, Nicole Stott. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Okay, I'll bring that up. But I'm, I'm um, first, before, before I talk, and I gotta read this because um, I didn't memorize it, but I wanna um, thank everyone for joining us today. I uh, have a pretty special task uh, of presenting a very prestigious award here at Embry-Riddle. We have an astronaut scholar in our presence. And as a little background, um, and this scholar is being um, presented award through an organization called the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, which was founded in 1984 by the original Mercury 7 astronauts. Their goal was to ensure that the United States would continue to be the global leader in science, technology, engineering, and math. And since 1984, astronauts from the Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, Space Shuttle, and International Space Station programs have also embraced their mission. The Astronaut Scholarship Foundation partners with industry, universities, and individual donors to identify the best and brightest university students pursuing, pursuing STEM degrees and to award those students with scholarships. The Astronaut Scholarship is known nationwide as being among the largest merit-based monetary scholarships awarded to undergraduate juniors and seniors. The Astronaut Scholarship Foundation has awarded more than 600 scholars with scholarships totaling more than $7 million. However, the scholarships are not solely monetary in nature. ASF maintains a lifelong relationship with each astronaut scholar and provides her or him with mentors, opportunities for personal and professional development, and chances to connect with astronauts, executives, and industry leaders. As an astronaut myself, who is a proud supporter of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation's work and who understands the significance of this award, it's my pleasure to introduce the 2021 Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University Astronaut Scholar, Grace Robertson. Come on up. Here. So first of all, thank you all for being here. I know you're all mostly here for Nicole because let's be honest, <laughs> she's the cool one. Um, <laughs> but a bit about me, I'm a senior here in our aerospace engineering department. I've been a long member of our honors program and I've had made many a friend through that program and it's led me a bit to where I am today. Um, after graduation, I'll be moving out to Denver, Colorado. I've already started my journey here in the space industry working down at Kennedy Space Center for Sierra Space as a systems engineer. I'll be continuing that role post-grad um, out in Denver and uh, living, up, living up the dream out there in the mountains. <laughs> um, being a part of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation means more to me than I may have ever known before. Um, this is our, the university's first year in the program. I am the university's first scholar and I'm really proud and excited to even have that title. So I didn't really know what this was going to mean to me at first, right? There's the obvious things. There's the scholarship that pushes me through the end of my senior year. There's the networking opportunities. There's the really great connections that I've gotten just as being a part of the foundation. Um, and then there's the non-obvious things. There's the community and the friendship that I've made out of this. I've now gotten a cohort of different individuals throughout the country with different disciplines that I will now always be able to be connected through and have that connection through the rest of my life. Being a part of this foundation definitely wasn't something easy. 
So the people that have gotten here um, definitely include some key people, including Dr. Troy Henderson, Dr. Jeffrey Kane, who wrote both on my behalf to be in the foundation, my research team, you guys down in front. We've spent a lot of hours together and pushed each other to be better people overall, and I couldn't be here without you guys. My inner circle, you guys know who you are. Um, we've spent a lot of nights, and if you've cried over a math assignment with me, you really know there are days. Um, so without those people, A, I wouldn't be as, like, we're in the position that I am today, nor would I be the person I am, regardless. So something I wish I could tell younger me, right? Um, what I've learned now is to learn fast, love hard, and laugh often, because while you go throughout your time here, you've got so many different things. Your goals at the end of your time here, much like mine, will not look the same. At the beginning of my time at this university, I did not think that A, I would be standing in front of all of you people saying what I'm saying, or that my goals would look quite like what they do. I've accomplished more than I thought. I accomplished more than what I thought I was ever capable of. I've made more good memories through the tough times than I have the good times, and that's just taught me more than I could have ever imagined. So what I would tell younger me, and what I would tell those of you that are younger students in the room, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna do just great. If you let your passions carry you through, through everything that you could have ever imagined, you're gonna land exactly where you wanted to, and you're gonna land exactly among the people that you really need to be among. They're going to teach you things that you never thought that you needed to be taught, but they're gonna make you a better person, a better engineer, a better physicist, a better pilot, and that, at the end of the day, is all that matters. If you're contributing to your own dream and the dream of the people around you, that's what you should take away from life. Thank you. Let's not let you walk away without, without this here. <laughs> Look at your friend. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm gonna hug you. How cool is that? Very cool. And I just, I, you know, I'm, um, there's a, a gentleman in the, the room today. I don't know where he is. Um, Preston, I don't know where you are, but I'm gonna um, give a big shout out to Mr. Root for working alongside um, me and um, Al Drew was mentioned earlier as an astronaut grad, as well as um, Ron Guerin. I'm just throwing us under the bus here, but very, very happy to have been able to work with ASF to put this Embry-Riddle scholarship in place. And we look to bring on more of these Embry-Riddle graduate astronauts that I'll talk to you about um, in a little bit to, to help this grow even more. And Preston, thank you for, I don't, I don't know where you went, but thank you for, there he is. Um, thank you for supporting along with us. Really, really means a lot. And, um, and maybe we can do another zero G flight sometime. That would be awesome. Highly recommend that as well if you've never, if you've never done it. Okay, so I've been asked to give a little bit of scoop on flying in space, what it was like to fly in space, um, a little bit about, I'm just gonna share it with you whether we want to hear it or not, what I'm doing now. But um, I'm gonna start off with this, this, it's like a little three minute video. You can see that beautiful book on the screen. That's a book I just finished writing. Um, it's not meant as a sales pitch for the book, though please feel free to buy it if you <laughs> want to. Um, but the publisher put together a, a, a nice trailer for it that I think will give you an idea of where I'm at, at least as a result of that space flight experience. And I look huge. I'm big on the screen when it comes up. Ordinary audio? vantage points from inner space on the Here, Aquarius Undersea Habitat. You, you know, why should you not hear it all? I've been blessed to experience our planetary home from some extraordinary vantage points. From inner space on the Aquarius undersea habitat to outer space on the International Space Station. Witnessing the complexity of human survival in these extreme environments, I discovered three unifying and life-changing lessons. We live on a planet, an overwhelmingly beautiful, glowing, colorful, crystal clear planet. We are all earthlings, and the only border that matters 
is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets and protects us all. We build our spaceships as mechanical life support systems, like the ISS, to mimic as best we can what Earth does for us naturally. As a crew on the space station, we know that our survival depends on staying acutely aware of the health and well being of our atmosphere, of our spaceship, and of all our crewmates. In contrast, here on Spaceship Earth, we pollute our atmosphere our oceans and our soils. We are experiencing devastating impacts to our planetary life support system and to all life we share our planet with. To survive and thrive, we must bring these three simple lessons of planet, earthling, and thin blue line into our daily lives. I came back to Earth knowing that by behaving like crewmates, not passengers, we have the power to create a future for all life on Earth that's as beautiful as it looks from space. Okay. So it's, it's pretty incredible, I think. And, and hopefully you're experiencing some of this as you're going through school and there's all this complexity of everything, but underlying it all, there's always the simple kind of grounding lessons. And for me, like I said in that video, I mean, it's, it, and it kind of seems kind of silly. These are things we learn when we're in kindergarten, right? You know, we know we live on a planet, but I can tell you, I look through the window of my spaceship and I'm like, holy moly, we live on a planet. I mean, it becomes your reality. You know, this idea that we're all earthlings, really and truly the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere. And those kinds of simple things, I think, are what then drive the way we study at school, the kinds of things that we choose to do with our lives, and how we bring those, th those three things into our life, I really and truly do believe, allow us to take on that, that ultimate important role of being crewmates and not passengers. It's a big difference. And for all of the people that fly in here, you know the role of crewmate is very different. It's an active, proactive role in the airplane, in your, in your spaceship, versus being a passenger on that vehicle. Um, so we're here at Embry-Riddle. I could, the, let's, let me date myself just a little bit here because um, 1987 was my senior year in high school. I could tell you this building didn't exist, that beautiful student union that you have now, it's now in the place of what was the new building when I was here, the library. And there was still that ABC thing with all the brick buildings over on the side and um, Lehman building wasn't even here yet. But um, holy moly, how awesome was it to be here? I congratulate all of you for choosing Embry-Riddle um, as your university. Um, I would not be standing here in front of you, I don't believe. There's these kind of key steps along the way and coming here was one of those for me. The people that I met, my professors who supported me, uh, when, and, and I love it, I hope you're finding this too, you can sit in the front row, you can sit in the back row, but you have total access to the faculty, to their time, to their expertise, and they want, they want to share that with you. I, I loved it. I still know most of the people in this picture. Um, as you can see, the late 80s, that was big hair days for the for the women, but it was, it really was one of those, I think, um, key, key stepping stones for me. I was aeronautical engineering, that was our senior design class. I don't know if they have all those props anymore or not. You know, in this path to becoming an astronaut, you know, for me it was a love of flying, wanting to know how things fly, that led me here to study aeronautical engineering. I discovered, man, if you want to know how airplanes fly, why would you not? want to know how rocket ships fly, and we have this beautiful facility right down the road that you know, Grace is working there. Hopefully some of the rest of you will have a chance to be there and then um, you know, and see what's going on with, with all of that. But I mean, that led me to the job as a NASA engineer at Kennedy. Um, that was when we were getting back up and running with the space shuttle program after the Challenger accident. They brought in a whole bunch of new engineers to do the work there. And I got to see everything. In my 10 years there, I saw everything from how we have the shuttle in the, the hangar to what goes on on the runway to the launch control center, the vehicle assembly building, all of it. And it really prepared me to finally get to the point where I applied to be an astronaut. And it took me a long time to get to that point. I second-guessed myself every step of the way. 
Because in my mind, while astronaut was this really super cool thing that, you know, that why wouldn't everybody want to do that, it seemed like it was something only other special people get to do. So until I got to the point where I was like seeing astronauts come through at the Kennedy Space Center, helping get the vehicles ready for them to fly, and seeing what they do, which by the way, 99.9% .9 of an astronaut's job, not flying in space, sadly. And as best I could tell, 80% of what an astronaut does was all, a lot like, I mean, it was like what I was doing as a NASA engineer already. So that at least encouraged me to speak to some of the people I considered to be mentors, who encouraged me, honestly, to do nothing more than the one thing I had total control of, which was to pick up the pen and fill out the application. And I can tell you, without their, you know, without their words of wisdom, I mean, it seems so obvious, I would not have done that on my own. And if they had started out by saying something like, oh, Nicole, you know, thousands of people apply to be an astronaut, it's such a long shot. If those words had come out of their mouth, I would not have picked up the pen and filled out the application. And yet, they didn't say, oh, Nicole, you'll make the greatest astronaut there ever was, though they might say that now. Um, they just, it's like they gave me permission to do the one thing I had total control of, pick up the pen and fill out the application. So do that for yourselves. Do not second guess yourself out of really wonderful opportunities. Pick up the pen and fill out the application. And then as you're preparing to go to space, you get to do really cool stuff like this, like go live underwater for 18 days, just down the road from here off the coast of Key Largo. It's really amazing habitat called Aquarius. It is absolutely the closest analog to what it's like to live and work in space. And I got to spend a little over three weeks there with my crew of five other people and um, you know it's an extreme environment you can't just go out the door without special equipment on same thing as space can't swim to the surface to escape problems that are happening at 60 feet underwater you have to deal with them there just like we have to do it on the space station you can't hop in your spaceship and come home anytime you want um, you have to figure out as a crew how to work together and manage things in that place and so um, and I would encourage you, the, the, I think it's Florida International University that runs this facility now down there, and they welcome visits to their topside facilities in Key Largo. And um, several years ago, when they were up and running with multiple um, NEMO missions going on, we were actually able to get some Embry-Riddle students involved with some projects um, for the missions, got to go out on the boats and things, and hopefully that'll start up again once all this stuff that we're wearing masks for. Um, settles down. All right, so going to space, um, I show this picture because it reminds me in one picture what it was like to be in space. It's really beautiful. As you can imagine, it's really beautiful to look out your window to be in space. Um, I also love it because there's kind of a contradiction here. I mean, you look at it, it looks like just this still silhouette. That's the space shuttle Atlantis. I'm on my way home after three months on the station. And it looks like it's just hanging there still in space. And yet I know that we're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour around the planet, about five miles a second, which means we orbit the Earth every 90 minutes. And because of that, every 45 minutes or so, we get one of these stunning sunrises or sunsets out the window. That absolutely has to be part of a picture that would remind me of what was being in space. I know I'm inside that little space shuttle with my six crewmates on our way home to our families, which is a nice place to be. And I also know that my friend Jeff Williams, who I spent some time on the space station with, has taken this picture for us. And he still has a couple months to go, but like this memory of what it was like to be in space. And as you saw in the video and heard in the bio, um, my time in space was primarily spent on the International Space Station. I mean, a masterpiece. Tell me that doesn't look like just gorgeous, like the artists were involved somehow in creating this place. I mean, lay it down on the ground, it's bigger than a football field, weighs over a million pounds. The internal volume, you know, those cans, the pressurized places where we're living and working in our regular clothes, floating around, you know, doing our work, um, ginormous. It's like, imagine in here, you didn't just have to sit on the, stand on the floor, sit in your chairs. You could use the whole volume of, of this auditorium. It just becomes a really huge space to work in, in space. And um, you're there with your crewmates representing these 15 different countries, working peacefully and successfully together on this mission that's all about ultimately improving life on Earth. 
And that's a pretty cool place and, and group of people to be a part of. And I could spend all day talking about this one image. I think there's so much in this that is just a wonderful example for how we should be living and working together here on Spaceship Earth. And, um, and I'll just say, like I said in the video, you know, this, this idea we build these mechanical systems, right? So that we can live there as life support systems, mimic what Earth does for us naturally. And the six or seven people that are living on board there all the time, they know that at a very basic level, every day they have to pay attention to how much CO2 is in their atmosphere, how much clean drinking water they have, the integrity of their thin metal hull, the health and well-being of all their crewmates. And they have to do that just to survive. They can't do any science or any flipping around or looking out the window until they know those things are taken care of. And that's exactly what we should be doing together down here on Earth. All right, I'll move on. All right, so we build this life support system in space, right? So that we can live there, so that we can do that work we want to do, that science that helps us improve life on Earth, these relationships that we're developing between these countries that you know, otherwise, you know, in a lot of cases, don't have such a good thing going on down here on Earth. But I personally believe if we didn't have this going on, maybe not this going on, but <laughs> these relationships in space, it would be a lot. It, I mean, I think it tempers what's happening down here on Earth because we know um, how we can work together in space. Um, I love this picture because, I don't know, I just look at it and I see, to me, it's like the best kind of people you want to work with in a team, anywhere, a crew in space. You want to know you're going to have a good time. You should have a good time in space. You should enjoy yourself there, right? There should be personality. Um, somebody was asking me, what's the... You know, what's the thing that stands out in somebody to pick them as an astronaut? And what I said was, when you get to the selected to come for an interview, your resume is good, what you've done at school, what you've done at work. But when we interview people, we want to know that we'd like to spend six months, you know, in a relatively confined space with them and that they would be respectful of each other and those kinds of things. And then on top of that personality, you want to know that when it hits the fan, as it's going to, because things don't always go as planned, you want to know that the people you're there with will have your back. And I could count on every single one of these people. And I witnessed how they had my back in cases where the alarm is going off at 3 o'clock in the morning telling you that all of your air is spewing out of your space station. It was I was really, really proud to see how we came together to respond to those kinds of things. Um, the guy, whose name is Guy, um, two in uh, the front row from the left. Um, this is the explanation of why we have clown noses. I don't know if you noticed them, but we have clown noses on. Uh, was the owner, founder of Cirque du Soleil, had to spare $30 million or so to um, train and ride with the, the Russians on the Soyuz spacecraft, spent about 10 days there with us, considers himself a clown, so he shared clown noses with us all. It was really nice to have him up there for... Um, for that time. All right, so really I put this picture in because it's got an Embry Riddle t-shirt on. Wore that while I was in space. Um, but it's fun because, you know, we're, we're up there doing science, right? And this, this was one of my favorite experiments was getting to harvest plants and looking at how they would grow in different mediums and those kinds of things. But pretty much any area of science you can imagine is being studied on the space station. And some of that science is purposely being done in that environment just for terrestrial purposes, to improve things down here on Earth. Most of the um, human physiology kinds of things we do, I think 70, 80% of that is, is about Earth-bound problems and solving them. And then all of the rest of the science that we do has a dual purpose. It is helping us improve life on Earth in one way or another, and it's helping us explore further off the planet. Um, I could talk again all the, you know, about all the different kinds of work we do up there and all of that, but I want to transition to um, maybe one of the best kind of human sides of being in space, of being part of human spaceflight, is in addition to the floating and the flying and you know, just how your, your, your whole environment and the way you move and live in it is very different, the opportunity to look out the window. Um, I would guess that any astronaut we talk to, that's at the top of the list. For, um, for the experience. Looking through the window, experiencing our home in a new way. I um, felt like when I was in space, there was kind of this evolution of looking out the window. Uh, when I first got 
to space. Of course, I wanted to float up and just see what was ever there. I don't even remember what that was. Was it water? Was it land? I don't know. I just know it was gorgeous and was more stunning than I even expected it to be. You know, it's like overwhelmingly, impressively beautiful. And every time I looked out the window, I felt that way. But I did want to see Florida from space. I mean, I considered Florida my home. I wanted to see Florida through the window. If I knew it was out there, I would take a picture if I, you know, if I had a camera with me. And it was important to me to make that connection to something that was familiar, that I felt like was my home. But it was cool how, over time, you know, there was this evolution of wanting to get to know the geography of the planet, of wanting to like, see my station kind of um, as this foreground to, to the Earth below, and um, watch my crewmates crawling around the bottom of the space station and looking at them like, wow, why aren't they falling off? You know, they're on the bottom of the space station. And getting your brain wrapped around that and those, just the different kinds of things that go along with being in microgravity. But I, I still always wanted to see Florida from space. But Florida, and you can see Florida jutting in from the right side of this picture, Florida became part of a planet, a special place on a planet that's my home. And I don't know when that happens. Was it day three? Was it two days before I left? I, I don't remember, but it's very actively um, something that happened. And so now I don't, I mean, Florida is a special place, but I don't think of Florida as my home anymore. I think of a planet, like we live on a planet as my home. And when you're there, um, let me see if I can make this work. This is a quick one. You know, I don't know about you, but here in Florida, I always thought about lightning storms, thunderstorms, like that's just happening over my head. When it's gone, it's gone, you know? But lightning, when it's, it's like neurons firing in a brain. It's, that's what it looks like when you look at Earth with the lightning strikes, especially at night. It's like, oh my gosh, it looks alive, like the planet is alive. And lightning to me was the thing that really made me realize Wow, there, it's like there is no other side of the planet. Everything is interconnected. This lightning that's happening over Florida, it is wrapping around the planet to Africa to where I can't see it anymore. And that was this, you know, again, maybe all of you already get that, like everything is interconnected. It's a big deal um, to realize that and then to let that sink in to how, you know, you'll live and work and behave um, in your life. Now, next one. So this picture. Again, a shift. Um, part of going to space, I mean, it's really as a kind of a personal experience on your own level is a big deal. You know, you want to experience it for yourself. But I think one of the greatest things in all of it is to be able to share it with other people. And that includes your family. Um, my son was seven when I flew to space the first time. And so I would bring him out as much as I could to all the training that I did. Um, on the way, you know, and preparing to go to space. So his whole little life was, you know, growing up with his mom preparing to go to space. And, you know, he'd come out. I, I didn't bring him to, like, the classroom stuff where I was learning how to speak Russian because that would have been really bad. Or if I was learning about, you know, just like classroom stuff like the electrical system or something. But where you were going to wear the really cool astronaut stuff, like the outfits, and then, you know, do something fun, I'd bring him to those kinds of things so he could see what I was doing, so he could meet the people. And then before every um, space shuttle flight, NASA invites your family with you out to the simulators. And we had these launch and landing simulators. And this was um, my son high-fiving my commander, Steve Lindsay, who, by the way, is at Sierra um, Space, ladies, and um, head of all crew stuff and flight ops stuff. And um, Roman had just successfully landed the space shuttle. He did that multiple times, but he was getting a high five from Steve for that. But it's, so it's really cool in the way we can share the experience, and we should. Um, I also wanted to share it with the places that were important to me that helped me kind of make it to that place in space. And so I brought Embry-Riddle with me with t-shirts, and I brought up little pennants, and of course you can take pictures in you know, front of the window and stuff. And, um, Embry-Riddle is really pretty unique. There are other universities with multiple astronauts, but I think for a university this size to have nine graduates as astronauts is a pretty, a pretty special thing. Um, we have the first of our, our graduates is Susan Still, Kilrain. She was the youngest um, female, she was the second female pilot of the space shuttle, and she was the youngest pilot to fly on the space shuttle, at least at that point. 
Um, Dan Burbank flew shuttle and station. My buddy Ron Guerin, who's in on the scholarship, um, up there in the top right, we were in the same class together. Um, Josh Kutrick is in one of the newer classes. He hasn't flown yet. I believe he's actually Canadian, but um, went to Embry-Riddle. Terry Verts, um, also in my class of 2000. Um, Chris Sombrowski and Jared Isaacman, do you guys know who they are? Yeah. Yes, awesome. So just flew, seems like just the other day, but recently on the Inspiration4 mission, you know, all civilian crew, no professional astronauts, orbiting the planet for three, three days and raising really awesome money for St. Jude. Um, great guys. And then Al and I, who got to fly together on STS-133, which was really, really fun to be you know, with somebody that went to the same school as you and be able to pack shirts to take. I mean, it seems kind of silly, but it was, it was a big deal. Those are, in, those are hanging in somewhere, somewhere on the school, somewhere. Um, I don't know. I gave them back. And then, you know, everywhere I go, I meet graduates from Embry-Riddle. Um, one of my trainers in the neutral buoyancy lab, you know, and I tried to get people, take pictures with your Embry-Riddle pennant so we can, you know, we can do something with it later. But Every place I went, even as we're getting ready to, in, in our final checks of the um, space shuttle discovery before flying, here's a guy, John, who graduated from Embry-Riddle and was helping us get all you know, checked out and figuring out our place inside of the vehicle. Um, we are everywhere, so keep an eye out. Um, and now, as I, you know, I retired from NASA in 2015. That was a difficult decision to make, take myself out of the lineup for flying in space. Um, I think I probably would have flown in space again since then if I had stuck around, but there's so much, I mean, you know, to me, like flying in space really put me in a position to do a lot of other things, to find like that next mission in life. Um, I had the chance to paint while I was in space. It's another one of those ways that we put, I think we put the human in human space flight, you know, bring part of what you enjoy to space with you. It's more than just the working there. I mean, you're living there for extended periods of time now. I painted with watercolors, but we've had musical instruments. You know, from the beginning of, of space flight, people have been packing things and playing musical instruments. There's a, two, a keyboard, two flutes, a guitar, you know, on, on station, um, my friend Chell Lindgren brought bagpipes to the space station. <laughs> you gotta really love your crewmate to let him bring bagpipes to the, the space station. But I mean, he wanted, I, you know, I think he already knew how to play. He was some, some like Scottish military compact version of the bagpipes. But it was so, it ended up being a really, really special thing for him. Not just because, you know, it's something he enjoys doing, but, you know, sadly, a, a friend of their family passed away while he was in space. I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it. He played Amazing Grace from the space station for his family and friends for that. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I think, there's, I think there's a video online that you can watch of that. But just to be able to make that connection back to the people you care about in this place that's so extraordinary. And, you know, and we've had artists in space since the very beginning. Alexei Leonov, cosmonaut, took colored pencils with him and drew orbital sunrises and sunsets. And um, he was the commander of that historic, iconic, I would say, Apollo-Soyuz mission, where back in the Soviet days, we docked together in space. And those guys, all of those crew members, were friends for the rest of their life, especially Alexei and then Tom Stafford, who was the US commander. I mean, like buddies. They look like kindergartners together, you know for the rest of their lives, friends. And, he, and Alexei did pencil portraits of all of his crewmates. I mean, it's kind of cool to think about this using your whole brain thing. And I encourage all of you to do that. You know, really acknowledge the other stuff. You know, besides what you're studying in school, acknowledge the other stuff that really is who you are. And take advantage of that. And really let that build out in you know, and how you solve problems and the people you hang out with and the opportunities that will open up because of it. Because I can tell you again, on the other side of that table, interviewing people to be astronauts, you want to know that people are more than just what they studied at school. That they understand how what they studied at school is impacting real life around them. And that they have real lives around them to do, you know, and are enjoying things like drawing or painting or playing music or building houses, whatever it might be. So that whole art and space thing you know, has led to what I'm doing now, which is working with kids in the Space for Art Foundation. I just want to show you this, this quick little video to give you a little um, indication of what this work has been. Um, 
Those are a couple of the art spacesuits we've done. Each little piece of art is a kid's piece of artwork that our spacesuit company that made that suit I wore on my spacewalk, um, ILC Dover, the spacesuit company, by the way. Don't let anybody else tell you they're the spacesuit company. It's ILC Dover. And they're also building the habitats that um, Sierra Space is using for the Life, um, Life Habitat and Space Station. Um, but they helped us quilt these together. That's Gary folding it up. These suits have, some of them have flown to the station on cargo vehicles. We've done these uh, conversations with the kids from Mission Control up to the station. That's Jack Fisher wearing the suit on station. That's Peggy Whitson flying around the space suit um, on space. But so cool for these kids to see this coming together. Most of these kids are in hospitals, refugee centers, orphanages, but it's kind of cool how you can take something like flying in space, combine like this love of art, and then really find, you know, find the next thing you're meant to do in life. I, I feel very fortunate for that. <clears throat> okay, um, these are seven dear friends. Today is the anniversary of their landing and the um, Columbia accident. I felt like we could not go away today without acknowledging these amazing people. And knowing that we have to keep them and our Challenger and our Apollo 1 crew members in mind in all that we do, you know, to be vigilant, to be aware, to stay deliberate and diligent about the way you work and the care you take for the people around you. And that's everything from engineering to how you treat each other day to day. And um, these were seven really in incredible people. And let's not forget them. And then here we'll close with a beautiful picture of Florida at night from space. That's and I hope I didn't. Did I take too much time? <laughs> but, so I think, do we still have time? Did I ramble on too long, or do we have time for some questions? And, OK, cool. All right, Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm saying when I say that? Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. So if you like, oh, I can't do anything. <laughs> Me and this microphone's not having friends tonight. Uh, anyway, so um, we're going to take some time for Q&A. We'll have two microphones down here. So if you want to line up and ask a few questions, we also have some folks, if you're streaming in from us, we'll, if you want to put your questions in the chat box. And if we have any ready to go in the chat, we can ask. We have one question. Is this working? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So as a fellow crewmate, what do you feel is our biggest responsibility other than protecting our home from Raj? Well, I think, I mean, I think it's being aware of the other life around you and how it's surviving or not on the planet. I think it's really just taking responsibility for, the, for, for your own actions. I mean, it seems so simple. It's what we're told as kids growing up. but. Um, but just being, being responsible. It's, it seems so simple. And that's, that's what we're doing as crew on the space station, whether we're being responsible for how, you know, how um, the kind of the health and well-being of each other or the health and well-being of our spaceship equipment or of the experiments that we're doing. Um, by paying attention to that, I think it, it really underlies the, the role of, of crewmate and not being a passenger just floating around Hoping everybody else will take care of you. All and, right. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say the acoustics are pretty good in here. So if somebody, if you don't feel like you want to come to the microphone either, but oh, look at you, good, good job. You were an engineer, right? Yes, I was. And you got to learn like the application and the theory. Um, how did your operational knowledge improve through your work at SpaceX or sorry at uh, NASA and? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It slipped out, it slipped out uh, at NASA and then going to the ISS. Well, I think I always was a person who liked hands-on stuff. Like, you know, I liked building things. I, I think art is, a, you know, like creating things with your hands. I liked woodworking and, you know, um, doing stuff around the house. So I think I already had that kind of sensibility. Um, my dad built and flew small airplanes when I was growing up, so I spent a lot of time out at the airport with him helping on, on airplanes, flying in airplanes. I think the operator side of it was something that I always honestly enjoyed more, and I found this out by, by working first at Pratt & Whitney and discovering that, man, structural design engineering was not for me. And thank God for the people who love it, right? Because I'm like, and they were really, really good at it, but I'm like, I just can't do that. I have to be where the hardware is. 
And so I think I already had it in me to, to appreciate and be fairly good at the operations side. But Kennedy Space Center is all about operations. I mean, the hardware comes there. It's either being assembled or it's being prepared to fly or it's being fixed, you know, whatever that might be. And that is all the physical implementation of um, getting a vehicle ready to fly and prepared for the crew members to use it on orbit. And I mean, to me, there was nothing better. I, I mean, so thankful for the experience I had at KSC. And I'll, I'll just share with you, one, one of those mentors that encouraged me to pick up the pen, his name is Jay Honeycutt. And he worked, he worked as a young engineer at Johnson Space Center, early days on the Apollo program. He was in the um, control room helping with solve the problems for the Apollo 13 stuff. Um, he's the guy who helped you know, create and design the, the trainers that we use, the launch and landing simulators, the, the single system trainers that we use and stuff. And he ended up being the um, center director at Kennedy Space Center. And he was responsible for all of shuttle when I started working there in the late 80s. And a bunch of us young engineers came in to start working. And we came from all different places around the country. And he brought us in and told us that we were working at the best place that there could possibly be to work on Earth. And he reminded us that our role is to solve problems, is to go into every problem believing there's a solution to the problem. And that our motto, and he wanted us to live by it, and I have it on a little astronaut with a yellow sticky, and I've, everywhere I've gone since then, and the motto is, here's how we can, not why we can't. And I'm telling you, if you approach stuff, I don't know if it, whether it's studying for a test or the most complex problem challenge you come up with, if you go in with that positive attitude, it's amazing the solutions that come from it. And I think that's embedded in being a really good operator of things too, hands-on as well. Welcome. Oh, break and write, okay. Hi. Uh, Hi okay. I'm Michi Ramos. I just wanted to ask you, uh, I noticed on social media recently you went to Antarctica and I was wondering if you could talk about that experience compared to being in space. Wow, I uh, highly recommend that too if you ever get the chance. Holy moly. We went down for, the, at that time there was a total solar eclipse going on and that was kind of the point of the trip, although seeing all that Antarctica has to offer is really, really amazing. Um, it was one of the worst storms in history down there, and so there was no seeing of the, the eclipse, but we hung out in the peninsula area and kind of the coastal continental area. I, you know, I think there's so much to compare. Just like, you know, you went out on that ship's deck for, if you didn't have the right equipment on, you're not surviving. Um, relying on, you know, the other people that were on the ship with us to make sure we kept track of everyone and, you know, if we went out on an excursion somewhere that we brought everybody back that you went out with, you know, the penguins weren't dragging them off somewhere. And um, just the complete otherworldliness of it. We were on a boat with where the, the group of people that were the passengers, there were 20 of us, and then there was a crew of maybe 30. And we never saw anyone else the entire time we were down there. It was pristine. It was like there weren't even footprints in the snow. They hadn't even opened up the, the little bases that were around there yet. We were like the first of the season to get down there. And, and I mean, otherworldly is all I can think of, is that it's just so different to how we live our daily lives. I, m my husband and I, sadly, we couldn't take our son with us. He probably will not forgive us for a long time. But, um, but we're still trying to process just that whole experience and what, what it was about. And, and one of the things we got to do while we were there, I know that you don't want me to drag on about this, but I, can you tell I'm a rambler? I cannot, there is no short answer coming out of me. Um, we got to go, they had a, a submersible, so a little sub, and it was like a, the pilot and four passengers. And we went down, it was 183 meters, and I just, I had no idea that there was so much life in that cold water. And we went down, and then they you know, drove, you know, drove it up to, flew it up, I guess, to the wall that was like the shelf of the continent. And there were starfish, and sponges, and coral, and krill, and these little translucent, like freaky looking creatures that I don't even know what they were. And, um, and then in a distance, you know, there was a whale. And I mean, it was just the most incredible experience. And it's why I like to say, you know, I, I highly recommend going to space. I hope everyone in this room who wants to go gets to go someday. 
But you don't have to go to space to appreciate Earth as a planet, as our home, that we're Earthlings, that there's this thin blue line. I mean, all these things that, I mean, maybe you think I'm hokey saying that stuff, but it's, it's what we all share in common. And, and there is awe and wonder around us everywhere. I mean, just out in the grass there, if you look hard enough. Um, yeah, it's incredible. Thanks for asking. That was, that was. So we're gonna okay. bounce back to our online. Going is left. there any questions? Oh, Mike. On the left. Uh, we do not have any more at okay. this time. All right, we'll bounce it over here. Cool, awesome. I just wanted to say, first off, nice to meet you. I'm glad you have me here tonight. Um, my name's Elvis, and uh, not like Presley, just yeah. Elvis. <laughs> um, Costello? And, no, okay. All right, yeah. Crespo, I've gotten them all, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> but yeah, and um, I'm an astronomy and astrophysics major here at Riddle. And I just wanted to ask, um, is there one thing that you would probably change uh, maybe in your academic or in your career at NASA that you would like to change? If so, why? And if not, hmm. why? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I don't, I don't know. I don't think so, you know? Um, I think I was really, really fortunate. Like with what I did for NASA, I, I tell people sometimes, you know, when I graduated in the late 80s and started working at, when I moved from Pratt Whitney up to Kennedy Space Center, mm -hmm. and I mean, I got to work in the orbiter processing facility. I got to do the convoy commander job on the runway. I was in launch control. I, I mean, I moved to all these different places as a NASA engineer around all of what was going on to get shuttles ready to fly. And I would, talked to some of my friends who were engineers and they had gone to work for some company and they were realizing that, wow, I've kind of maxed out on what I can do here. Like three years later, they were moving to another company and to try to get different experience. And I'm like, how fortunate am I? I'm, I can move from on the same facility within what we're doing for shuttle activities and see all different kinds of aspects of it just by being in that place. And and then I think taking advantage of the opportunity to move to Johnson Space Center when I did. I, if I had not done that, I mean, well, I wouldn't be talking to you here if I hadn't done that. But I'll tell you, I interviewed twice for the astronaut office. The first time was um, I didn't get selected, but they offered me a job at Johnson Space Center as a flight engineer on the shuttle training aircraft. And that was an airplane that at Kennedy Space Center, it would come down and I'd beg to fly on that airplane. And I begged to fly in the T-38s and of course they're not gonna let you. And, and now I was, they were offering me this job to fly like as a flight engineer, you know, helping train the astronauts to land the space shuttle. And I could have turned that down. I mean, could have said, no, you know, I'll just keep working here at KSC. I'll do more of what I can see, you know, see and do here with shuttle and station. Because wasn't, I wasn't obligated to take that job. But they offered it to me. And they're like, yeah, Nicole, we'd like you to get some operations experience. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I worked in shuttle operations for 10 years. <laughs> what, do you know, what do they mean? But they, as the astronaut selection committee, were interested in me. But they wanted to see a little bit different side of who I was. And that job would, would give it to me. And it was the best thing I ever did. If I hadn't done that, I, that would probably be my answer. But I think like, like being uncomfortable a little bit with maybe a decision you're gonna make, opening yourself up to these opportunities that come at you that seem a little weird, sometimes are the best ones that you can take advantage of. And so if you interview for the astronaut job and they tell you they are not hiring you that time but they're, they'd like you to come take this other job, you take that other job. <laughs> because when I got there, that was in, in 1998, and in that class, Steve Swanson got selected. And I took Steve Swanson's spot as a flight engineer. And when I got selected in 2000, a young gentleman named Shane Kimbrough came in and took my spot. And now Shane just got back from Space Station a little while ago. He was, I mean, you know, so this, it was a place where they knew they could look at you in a different way and decide if they wanted to hire you or not. So you take that job. <laughs> awesome. Thank I don't know if that much. answered your question no, or not. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> So first off, pleasure meeting you. You my too, thank you. <laughs> my name is Malia Bowden. I am an air traffic management major. Fun. And, God um, bless you, man. That's another one. I could not do that. <laughs> and um, I've been to the gallery, and I've seen yeah, the wave. And I wanted to, wanted to ask, how was it drawing in space or making art in space? It was really fun. And it's one of those things that I don't think I would have thought to do on my own. Like, I wouldn't have thought, oh, bring that watercolor kit with you, Nikki, to space. 
But the woman, a, a dear friend who was one of the people that helped us pack all our stuff to take to the station, um, when we were getting ready, all the stuff that I like officially was taking, like the one pair of pants for three months and you know things like that. Um, she reminded me, she's like, Nikki, you're gonna be living there. You're not just working there. So if there's something you enjoy doing down here on Earth, and we got this personal kit where I put like the T-shirt and the pennant in too, that we could bring personal items with us. And I brought some things for my son and my husband and family and stuff. But she's like, you know, you're gonna be there. You know, bring something you enjoy doing on Earth. So I took this watercolor kit. And painting with watercolors, you can imagine, a little bit different in microgravity where water floats and you're not dipping your brush into a, a cup of water. It's like a floating ball of water. <laughs> and everything just behaves a little bit differently. So, I mean, in hindsight, I wish I would have videotaped it. Because I think just in that, how you would paint with watercolors in space could describe what it's like to be a human in space, the way you have to keep track of your stuff, how everything floats, things behave differently, all of that. But um, it, was, it, was like, it was definitely a personal highlight for me to have done that. And as you can tell, it's certainly influenced what I've done since then. Um, and I would say that, I mean, all, I mean, in any kind of thing you're doing, consider that side of you too. Like, how else can you experience um, where you go? When we went to Antarctica, I took that same watercolor kit, and, or a, a version of it. I left the one I painted with up there and, um, and painted while I was in Antarctica too. Because I think, I don't know, I think there's just something special about being in who you are as a human being with you to those places too. All right, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Welcome. Any other questions from the online gallery? One just came in. <laughs> from Sophia, I'm a 28-year-old mom of two that just started here in astronomy and astrophysics. What was your journey like as a mom? Was there ever a time that seemed daunting and how did you get through it? <laughs> like the whole time seems daunting, doesn't it, <laughs> as a mom? Right, I'm, I'm like I am up there, but I won't, won't point him out. It's still daunting, right? I think no matter what you're doing, whether you're an astronaut, uh, or whatever it is you're doing as, as a mom, as a parent, it's, it's daunting in some way or another. One of the things that we really tried to do um, with our son, who like I said was seven when I flew the first time, nine the second time. Um, I tried really hard to bring him out to these, these different events so that he would understand the people I was working with, the things I was doing. He would know when I got to space what it was, you know, why is she up there? And um, I really wanted as much as possible for him to feel like he was part of the crew. And so my husband and I deliberately, you know, made a point of that. And I think it was helpful for my husband that way too, to, um, to have that as part of the experience and to get to know everybody and, um, and see the places. You know, we, we were able to travel together to the different sites around the world, um, so we got to see that. I think that was really hugely beneficial in that, um, seeing that everybody doesn't live the same way we do and that that's okay and experiencing different cultures and things. Hopefully that was worthwhile for him. I won't ask him here because he'd get very mad at me. Um, and, um, but I think just finding, as with anything, I mean, I had a really great partner in it. My husband was amazing. Um, I was away a lot. Over 50% of my time for like three years was out of the country training for a station flight. And, you know, that's not an easy thing for, you know, in any situation. And so kudos to him. And then while I was in space, you know, I think, as a seven-year-old, he saw probably more James Bond movies and experienced Halo on Xbox before most kids should. But, um, <laughs> but you know, you can only control so much from, from space. But I think it's, there's, there's the balance thing, but having people that are really very supportive of you, too. Yeah. Oh, right here. Sorry. Sorry, I'm just standing yeah, here like that. Time for one more I question. just want to start out, thank you for coming, and I heard the future of space is like private companies and international partners for like the Artemis program and on to Mars, and what do you see us achieving with these private public relationships besides low Earth, or low Earth orbit platforms, the Artemis program, and Mars? Um, well, I think it's going to help. I mean, if you look at the avi aviation industry, I think you can look at that kind of as a parallel of how the industry overall will grow both publicly, privately. 
I think there's always going to be a role for NASA on extending things um, and then leveraging those partnerships. I mean, NASA always, you know, even on the space shuttle, it was contractors building the space shuttle, right? They just happened to build it for NASA and it became a NASA vehicle. Now you've got companies like SpaceX where NASA is still, you know, in that partnership funding uh, the bulk of that work, not Sierra Space, they're ones that have done it on their own. Um, but. But I think those partnerships are going to continue to be really important, and I think it's going to be much bigger than low Earth orbit. I mean, talk to Elon, he's already living on Mars, right? Yeah. So, but I mean, seriously, you know, he's got the see it, be it vision of, of those kinds of things. And so I think that's going to allow it just to keep extending, and that's going to be the technology that goes along with it, too, which um, I personally believe ultimately is all about improving life on Earth as well. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. All right, I think that is, the, that is our time, but I just want to say again, thank you for joining us this evening. Just a reminder, if you're interested in becoming an astronaut scholar, we are currently recruiting our next cohort this year. Uh, applications are due February 21st. If you would like any information, Office of Undergraduate Research, just pop me an email and I will send that information to you. And thank you all who are joining us online as well. And again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, guys.